The vertebral column is 26 irregular bones, and these 26 irregular bones are going to comprise a flexible and curved structure. So a lot of times uh, people may think of the spine of the spinal column as being very rigid like a rod but in essence it's actually very very flexible and this is very important in, in order to maintain proper health. So the vertebral column is going to act as the axial support of the trunk. The spinal column is going to extend from the base of the skull um, at the foramen magnum and it's going to extend all the way down to the tailbone area which is the sacrum. Now in the fetus and in the infant there's actually 33 separate bones but eventually nine of these bones are going to fuse to form two composite bones. These would be the sacrum and later the as well as the coccyx and the remaining 24 bones are then going to be irregularly shaped bones that are going to be separated by these intervertebral discs that we see. So there is ends up being 26 irregular bones after um, these bones have fused. Now there are regions of the vertebral column that are naturally going to be curved and you should know how many vertebrae are found in each area. The cervical region has seven vertebrae. There are 12 in the thoracic region, and then there are five in the lumbar region. A little mnemonic or memory trick that your book has is a way to remember the, the number of vertebrae in these regions. And if you remember that we eat breakfast at 7 a.m., or some people do, we eat lunch at 12 noon, and supper or dinner, depending on what part of the country you're from, at 5 p.m. This will help you remember how many vertebrae are found in each region of the vertebral column. The sacrum is going to articulate with the hip bones and the pelvis, so this is where we find the sacroiliac joints, which we'll be talking about more in chapter 8. And the very terminus is what is commonly called the tailbone, where the coccyx is. And we have important curvatures that are present. There are cervical and there's also the lumbar curvatures. The cervical and the lumbar curvatures are concave posteriorly. So they form a concave curve. curve. And then the thoracic and the sacral curves are going to be convex. So the thoracic and the sacral curves. So in order to have a healthy spine, it's, it's important to have these natural curvatures that are present. And you need to know a lot of the different bony landmarks that are shown in this slide that will be mentioned in subsequent slides. Now important homeostatic imbalances that you should know. There are three different ones. Some are going to be present at birth. Others result from disease, poor posture, uh, not sitting up straight. The first one is scoliosis. And scoliosis is thought of as a twist, the twisted disease. And it is called this because there is an abnormal lateral curvature. And this occurs most often in the thoracic region. You can see a curve here in the thoracic region that is lateral. It occurs sometimes in late childhood. Um, and also more severe cases can result from abnormal vertebral structure, muscle paralysis, and um, scoliosis can be treated with body braces or surgically when growth ends to prevent permanent deformity and some problems with breathing. The next type of curvature is called um, kyphosis or it's called hunchback and this is particularly going to be common in elderly people. It may also result from things like tuberculosis of the spine, um, rickets or osteomalacia which we talked about in um, previous chapters. So these could be possible causes of this but you can see certainly a hunchback that is forming there. 
um, in this lady with the red coat on. Unfortunately, this happens also because of the weakening of the vertebral bodies as we age. Then the third example would be lordosis, which is also called sway back. And this is an accentuated lumbar curvature that we normally don't see. It could result from osteomalacia. Uh, sometimes it occurs in pregnancy, as in this example. It could also occur in the example of uh, men with pot bellies. Our next slide is showing some of the important ligaments. And these ligaments are very, very important in allowing the vertebral column to, to stand up straight. So they must be held in very, a very elaborate system. The major supporting ligaments are the anterior and the posterior longitudinal ligaments that you can see shown here, the anterior longitudinal ligament and the posterior longitudinal ligament. These are going to be continuous bands that run up and down the vertebrae from the neck to the sacrum. And what they do is they are going to prevent hyperextension from occurring. So they have a sort of protective function in the spinal cord. So prevent from bending too far backward. The posterior ligament is going to risk hyperflexion of the spine and they're going to touch only two discs. And there are, there's another one called the ligamentum, ligamentum flavum, which is going to connect to adjacent vertebrae, and this is going to be especially strong. This is going to be composed of elastic connective tissue. Now the intervertebral discs themselves, which you can also see labeled on this particular diagram, the intervertebral discs are going to be made up of the uh, a nucleus propulsus in the center surrounded by a fibrocartilage ligament called the annulus fibrosis. And the annulus fibrosis is very important. It's going to limit the expansion of the nucleus propulsus when the spine is compressed. And so it is going to act as a sort of shock absorbable, uh, absorber as we um, continue to age. But a lot of times as we get older, unfortunately there can be herniations that occur in the intervertebral disc. So you can think of these as shock absorbers. And as you learned about in chapter four, they um, again are made up of fibrocartilage. So throughout the day as we um, add more shock to our spinal column, these shock absorbers are going to be more compressed and compressed. So they flatten throughout the course of the day. And this occurs because these intervertebral discs are going to become dehydrated throughout the day. So they're more hydrated as soon as we wake up in the morning. One of the homeostatic imbalances that can occur is a herniated or a prolapsed nucleus propulsus. And in this diagram you're seeing an MRI of the lumbar region showing a region of the herniated disc that is sticking out into the spinal column. And this can cause excruciating pain if the region of the herniated disc is going to push onto a nerve. Uh, the herniated disc commonly can also be referred to as a slip disc, though the term herniation is actually a more appropriate term. So in this case it would be a rupturing of the nucleus propulsus and in this case the nucleus ruptures through the annulus, through the annulus fibrosis. And sometimes they'll do, um, they'll do a discogram to look at the integrity of the annulus, which is, as you can see here, it's this fibrocartilaginous ring, which is going to maintain the integrity of the nucleus propulsus. 
and sometimes in a discogram it can reveal that the annulus fibrosus is torn and in this case you can see that the herniated portion of the disc is going to be protruding out into the region where the spinal nerve is and in that case it can push on the spinal nerve root. A lot of times these, these can be treated with some moderate um, uh, physical therapy but sometimes they do require some sort of procedure from occurring. So you should be aware of the different body bony landmarks of this vertebrae that are shown on this figure and they'll be on this next slide as well. So let's look at some of the major parts of this typical vertebra that you have in your textbook and each vertebra is going to consist of the body and the body is also called the centrum you don't need to know the term centrum but it is going to um, be thicker in the lumbar region of our spine and so one thing you'll need to know for this chapter is to be able to compare and contrast the different type of vertebrae based on where they are in the spinal column and it's thicker in the lumbar region because it supports a large majority of our weight in that region the um, disc shaped body then is going to be the weight bearing part then there is a hole that is important that you should know and um, remember the term for one of these holes that allows a nerve or a blood vessel to go through is a foramen one of the most important ones to know is the vertebral foramen and this is going to be a hole where the spinal cord is found then we also have the pedicles the pedicles are short bony pillars that are very important they project in a posterior direction from the vertebral body and they form kind of the sides of this vertebral arch area the other important region of the vertebral arch is the lamina and it completes the rest of the arch so if someone were to have for example a what's called a laminectomy a laminectomy is an important procedure that is commonly done for a herniated disc and in the case of a laminectomy what they're going to do is they're going to cut off the lamina region to allow for more um, more space for the nerve root a bilateral laminectomy would be when they cut off both lamina on that vertebrae then there's also a lateral opening called the intervertebral foramina which you can't see on this slide so we'll go back to a previous slide here and you can see the intervertebral foramina so you know what a foramen is now and inter means between so it's the hole between the vertebrae that allows for nerves to pass through these are going to be the nerves that extend to our arms or our legs depending on what region of the spine they're located in then we also have pr important processes that are going to be located on the posterior region of the spinal cord when you feel the back of your spine you're going to feel this pointed region called the spinous process so you should be able to recognize the spinous processes not only for lecture but also for your lab so all the vertebrae have spinous processes there are also other processes that extend transverse in a transverse direction so they're called the transverse processes and then there are also important um, parts of the vertebrae which allow articulation with the bone above it and below it these regions would be the inferior articular processes which have a surface a flat surface on them called a facet and those regions are shown kind of right in um, this specific area the, the, it's the process that's going to articulate with the, the bone above it and the bone below it so you can see these processes that are circled in this diagram right here and so we can't see them on um, the next slide but it would be referring to these regions right here so it's this region which is the 
articulating process, which again is going to allow it to articulate with the vertebra above it or the vertebra below it. So our next slide, and again these are the facets right here, you can see them labeled. The facet is on the process, so the process is this region of the bone, and the facet is actually the region of the bone that is going to form a joint or articulate with the vertebra above or below it. Our next slide is showing some examples of the cervical vertebra. And you don't have to know the names for all the, the different vertebrae, only the top two. The most superior vertebra is going to be called the atlas, and it is what whole attaches directly to the to the skull. So it articulates with the occipital condyles. So C1 is called the atlas, and C2, the second cervical vertebra, would be called the axis. So these are the only two that have specific names. The rest of them are named by the region of their spine, the spinal cord, or the spinal column, and also the number of the vertebra. So let's look at some of the general uh, parts of the cervical vertebra first. Again, they're named C1 through C7. And in this case, the body is going to look more oval, and it's not going to be as large as the thoracic and the lumbar region. So it doesn't really have as, as significant of a body. It still has a small body, but again, they're going to be, be more oval. The spinous process is going to be short. It usually, um, the spinous process directs direct, moves in a directly posterior direction. So I encourage you in lab to make sure that you examine these different spinous processes and note which direction that they point. The vertebral foramen is going to be shaped differently than the remainder of the vertebrae. And then each transverse process which you'll note is located right here. Each transverse process is going to contain a transverse foramen. So in lab, that's going to help you to be able to identify the, the cervical, a cervical vertebra versus a thoracic vertebra because it has a transverse foramen where there are specific blood vessels that pass through. The axis has a region of it called the dens and the dens is what allows the C1 to articulate on it, and it allows you to shake your head no. So some of the important characteristics of these vertebrae are that um, movement that can occur between the vertebrae are going to be flexion and extension. So tilting your head forward or tilting your head backwards can occur between the vertebrae. Also, the joint that is located between the skull and the atlas is going to be able, allow you to shake your head yes. And the joint that is between the atlas and the axis, which is going to occur because of the dens, is going to allow you to rotate your head. So to be able to shake your head, no. Some other important functions that are allowed by the, ver the vertebrae would be things like lateral flexion. So to be able to stand and to um, lean your torso towards your feet would be lateral flexion moving the upper body to the right or left. Also, there is some rotation that's going to be allowed as well. So let's look at the um, thoracic and the lumbar vertebrae as well. As we can see on this slide, uh, we see the seven cervical vertebrae, the 12 thoracic vertebrae, and the, the five lumbar vertebrae. And the first thing that you need to know, notice, is the spinous processes. The spinous processor processes are going to slope in an inferior direction in the thoracic region 
and they're going to be much larger in the lumbar region and shorter in the cervical region. One of the other things that you're going to notice is the vertebral foramen. They do change. The body is going to be the thickest, as I mentioned previously, in the lumbar region. And then the pedicles and the lamina in the lumbar region are going to be shorter as well as thicker. And so there's an important table that's in this chapter that's going to, that you'll need to study that's going to compare and contrast the differences between the different regions of the spinal column. Notice the cervical vertebra, again C2, which is the axis, has the dens. This allows you to, to shake your head no. We have the spinous process which is um, at C4, it is, um, has a forked appearance, a bifid appearance. The transverse processes, remember, are going to have transverse foramen. The, in the uh, lumbar region, there are going to be costal facets for the ribs, which are only in the thoracic region. Notice again, the spinous processes are gonna slope more downward and the transverse processes are not going to have transverse foramen. In the lumbar region, notice how the spinous processes look different. And again, the body is going to be very, very thick. So again, especially in lab as well, make sure you spend time comparing and contrasting the difference between the different regions. One thing that is really good to help you is when you look at a thoracic vertebra, it should look like the head of a giraffe. When you look at a lumbar vertebra, it should look like the head of a moose. So if you remember old, old cartoons, think of Bullwinkle the moose when you look at a lumbar vertebra. So this table in your textbook is showing the differences that you see between the vertebrae. So notice, um, first of all, when we, think, when we look at the body, the body is going to be smallest in the cervical vertebra. So here's your body in the cervical region. Uh, it gets thicker as we go to the thoracic region and then it is thickest in the body of the lumbar region. The spinous process is going to be short. Some of them are bifid, especially for the cervical vertebra. They're going to be long, a little longer and they project in, a, in an inferior direction for the thoracic spinous processes. And in the lumbar vertebrae, they're going to be short, rectangular, and they project more posteriorly. The vertebral foramen, this is a good view for them. For the cervical vertebra, they're going to be more triangular in shape. They're more circular in the thoracic vertebrae, and they kind of return to a smaller triangle shape in the lumbar vertebrae. The transverse um, processes are going to contain foramina in the um, in the cervical vertebra and again we do not see this at all when we get to the thoracic vertebra there are no transverse foramen at all and the same goes with the lumbar vertebrae the superior and articular processes the direction of the facets are going to differ between the three types of vertebrae they're going to face a different direction in the cervical region. Um, in the thoracic region, they're going to face more of an anterior direction. And then they're going to be more anterior lateral in the lumbar vertebrae. And then the movements are going to vary slightly between these different regions. For the movements in the cervical region, we have um, flexion and extension. We have lateral flexion, and the spine has the greatest region of movement in the cervical region, as we would expect. In the thoracic region, we have rotation that is allowed. We have lateral flexion, but it's kind of restricted by the ribs, and the flexion and extension is limited. The most limiting region of the spinal cord, as you would imagine, would be the lumbar region. It does allow some flexion and some extension some lateral rotation, but there is no rotation that happens in the lumbar region. 
So it's important that you use this, um, this table to study from. So I'll just go through and highlight some of these important parts to know. Again, the articular processes and facets, spinous processes, vertebral foramen where the spinal cord is, transverse processes, transverse foramen. And you should know the same things on the lateral view. So you could see some of these diagrams on the test and you'll definitely have to be able to label them when you get to the lab. And again, there could be more or less depending on who you have for your lab instructor. And I'm not gonna highlight the ones at the bottom, but you're responsible for the same ones. So the very last part of our of the spinal column is the sacrum. And the sacrum is a triangular shaped region of fused bones. And there are nine total bones between the sacrum and the coccyx. There's five that make up the sacrum and then four that make up the coccyx. So even though Napoleon Dynamite or Uncle Rico says that grandma fell off the sand dunes and broke her coccyx, it's actually pronounced coccyx. So notice that there are superior and inferior articular processes. Um, it's important to know that there is the sacral iliac joint where the sacrum is actually going to articulate at this point with the ilium. And that's, what, that's why this is called the auricular surface. It's where the ilium would articulate with the sacrum. The sacral promontory is going to be the highest region the high point of the sacrum and it kind of forms the superior margin of the sacral vertebra and there are important sacral nerves that are going to go through these foramen and these would be parts of the sciatic nerve for example as well as other, other ones uh, you don't have to know a lot of the other bony landmarks that are on the sacrum I'll highlight the ones that it's important for you to know. Those would be the sacral promontory. Uh, you should be aware of the sacral hiatus. And the sacral hiatus is um, an opening, um, an external opening on the, um, the, that you can view on the posterior side of the sacrum. And then, of course, you have to know the coccyx and the sacral foramina, where various nerves are going to be passing through the foramina.